Can I ask you to take a seat, please? Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to give you a warm welcome to this first uh, thematic session uh, on taking stock of the state duty to protect. Uh, if I could just introduce to you um, those who are on the panel. Uh, my name is Alan Miller. I'm chair of the European Group of National Human Rights Institutions uh, and chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, with me on the panel, starting from my uh, right, is uh, Tom Kennedy, who is the Deputy Head, Human Rights and Democracy Department from the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. On my right-hand side, then, is Bente Angle Hansen, Secretary General, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Norway. On my left, Daniel Rosenberg, Superintendent, Superintendency of Banks, Insurers and Pension Funds of Peru. And on the far left, Claire O'Brien from the International Coordinating Committee of National Human Rights Institutions and the Danish Human Rights Institution. And then on the far left, Michael Addo, a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. As you know, we're running a little bit uh, late, but um, we hope to catch up because, in fact, there is one speaker who has been delayed because of travel issues. Um, and that is Gretel Oraki, who was coming from Papua New Guinea. But I can say for those of you who were looking forward to uh, listening to her, she will be speaking at tomorrow's session at 10 o'clock in this same chamber uh, on state duty to protect. So I would invite you to come along if you'd like to hear from her uh, and the situation in Papua New Guinea. You already have the concept paper in the pack, so I'm not going to rehearse any of that. But what I would like to just spend a minute uh, is sharing with you um, some procedural guidance matters. Uh, the purpose of them, uh, as the High Commissioner said uh, in the plenary session, is to facilitate uh, an open, constructive uh, and respectful atmosphere. So in terms of how we plan to uh, manage this. Those participants who wish to speak from the floor should sign up at the speakers list which is available over here uh, at the desk against the wall. So just make your way over there and give your name and organization um, to the speakers list who will then register you. Uh, that's available right up until the end of the last panelist. Then the speakers list will be closed. The number of speakers um, able to speak may not be everyone who would like to, simply because of the time constraints uh, and the fact that we are starting uh, a little bit late. So I'm afraid it's not guaranteed that if you do sign up uh, that there will be an opportunity uh, to speak. But to try and ensure that as many can speak as possible, uh, I am asking you to limit the interventions you make uh, to no more than two minutes. Uh, and preferably not to read formal statements. There is a facility that formal statements can be given to the Secretariat and they can be posted uh, on the forum uh, website. We also will be making sure from the speakers list to ensure that there's a, a balanced representation uh, of interventions in terms of gender, background, geography, uh, etc. The order of speakers will be, uh, first of all, uh, Tom Kennedy. Then he'll be followed by Daniel Slodowski. Then we'll have Bente Angle Hansen. Then Claire O'Brien. Michael Addo will give some comments uh, on behalf of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights uh, at the end of the plenary. So he'll be listening to all the interventions uh, and will be able to pick up whatever issues he, he feels appropriate uh, at the end. So, um, without any further ado, and, and with your consent to, to those arrangements, I will now pass to Tom Kennedy 
uh, for the first intervention. Uh, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very honored to be here today and to have been asked to speak a little bit about the UK experience of implementing the guiding principles. We've been working very hard for 18 months since the endorsement of the guiding principles. Um, and I'd like to just describe in a few minutes the main steps that we took and that we have taken so far, some of the effects and impacts of the work we've done to date, and some of the challenges um, that we've overcome and some challenges that we anticipate now face us. As soon as the guiding principles were endorsed by the Human Rights Council, the UK government decided to take them and use them as the basis to build a UK government strategy on business and human rights. And a very key initial decision taken at that moment was to take a holistic approach to try and reflect the entirety of the guiding principles in whatever we could produce as a government strategy. Uh, the first practical step we took was to create a, a cross-government steering committee comprising all of those different key ministries within the government who have an interest in business affairs and an interest in these issues. And that group has been working ever since to take the work forward. We organized uh, some stakeholder outreach meetings to make this an inclusive process. We had separate meetings with uh, multinational enterprises from the UK, uh, a separate meeting with small and medium-sized enterprises and representatives, and a separate meeting also with civil society organizations. We asked the same questions in each of these exercises. What do these groups want to see in a government strategy on business and human rights? And what do they expect to see in a government strategy? We, we, took, uh, we took great note of every, everything that came out of these meetings. And we organized a final encounter where actually representatives of those three different uh, stakeholder outreach meetings sat together with the steering group, which is actually making the policy. Uh, and we had a very fruitful exchange at that point as well. So that process really informed the work we've done. The stage we're at now is that we've produced a draft government strategy. It has been agreed across uh, almost all of the government, but there are still just a few uh, points to finalize. Um, I had hoped that we might have it ready for this forum, um, but it looks like we will probably be launching the strategy early in 2013. Uh, just one important point about the strategy, implicit within the strategy is that this is a first expression of government policy on business and human rights and that we anticipate that we will need to update and refresh it uh, in the relatively near future and we're setting ourselves a date of 2015 for that. Uh, the other comment I would make is that the stakeholder engagement process that we had was an extremely rich part of, of our experience. And we are building into now our implementation of the strategy. Uh, we will build into that an ongoing consultation process with uh, civil society and business organizations to help us identify the way forward. To talk about some of the impacts or the effects of doing this work, um, on, on our government, it really has made the UK government examine for the first time the way in which the UK protects human rights in the business context, specifically within U UK jurisdiction, because that's an essential part of addressing pillar one, as you all know. The mapping we've done is a, a satisfactory mapping in the context of, of the strategy we're producing. But we anticipate a, a more in-depth mapping will be needed 
over the longer term. But mapping of government protection of human rights is an essential part of, of the process. The process has also made us look at the government's own leverage on business. In other words, through the government's contracts that we issue, through tender processes, through purchasing, the government does have tremendous leverage over business activity. So we've looked closely at this. We state in our strategy where the UK is in that context at the moment. But we already anticipate that this is one of the areas where we will do further work as we move forward. The third point is it really made us look as well at the UK provision of remedy. How is remedy structured in the UK? Where is it strong? Where is it less strong? Where might it need more work? So again, that's a mapping exercise, but related to pillar three. Looking at some of the challenges that we faced, the initial challenges were really building trust and confidence and understanding with the different people that we had to engage with. Firstly, within our own government. People are wary of new issues. People are wary of the expression human rights. What does it mean? What does it mean for me? They need to get used to that. They need to understand what the guiding principles are all about and see where they fit in. So the creation of our effort within the government took time. In the stakeholder outreach process, the same building of confidence and trust was very important. But I think that by being open, by showing that we really listened to what people were saying, we, we definitely built a better atmosphere of trust and confidence. And we had a very rich exchange. And I'm sure that individuals from both sides of that debate will recognize in our strategy paper elements of the ideas they put forward. In terms of moving forward and looking at the challenges, I would just name three or four. One relates to communication, communicating within the government now. What is this strategy on business and human rights? That's a massive task in itself. Communicating with business. We find many of the big companies are already well aware of the guiding principles. Some of them are already acting on the guiding principles. But many of the medium-sized and small companies have never heard of the guiding principles. So there's a lot of communication to do also to consumers, also to investors, because these are important groups in this debate, and they can bring pressure, but they have to understand what business and human rights is about. So communication is a massive task facing the guiding principles. I would just specify the challenge of communicating to business seems to us particularly important, and we have to communicate in terms of what makes sense to business, what is in it for business to get involved in this agenda. What's the business case? What are human rights? You know, don't give them a 20-page document on what human rights are. So there's a communication, a directness of communication that one has to try and find. And often the communication with business can be most effective if it's coming from business people, not from a government representative. So we're very actively looking for really good case studies of where companies have done the right thing, have done something good, and that we can use that as a communication tool with other companies, and they can understand that. But I think if we're going to encourage companies to, to give us their examples of best practice and where they think they've got it right, I think we need to embrace some risk as well. Let's not criticize the company for something it did somewhere else which maybe didn't work out so well because then companies aren't going to come forward and volunteer that kind of 
desperately important information. Um, another challenge, an important challenge that we, we want to explore much more now with stakeholders is how can our stakeholders contribute positively to taking the message forward? Will companies proactively tell other companies about their business and human rights practice to their supply chains, to others they interact with, to local chambers of commerce? So we're beginning to ask British companies, would you do this? Will you do this? As you embrace business and human rights work, will you go proactively out there with the message? We'd also be interested to know what civil society can bring to the mix. Could they work with companies to do human rights impact assessments? Could they liaise? Could they be the liaison with local communities, generate the right levels of confidence? We need to get beyond the NGO business confrontation and we need to make it work. And actually Dr. Selvanathan this morning, the chairperson of the working group said he wants to see governments, businesses and civil society working together as partners. So we see that as a very important line of work as we move to the future. I really look forward to the discussion of this and your questions and answers but we'll conclude at that point. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Tom. Could I now move to uh, Daniel? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as some of you probably know, uh, Peru is a major... Is it turned on? Yeah, okay. Um, as I was just saying, as you probably know, Peru is a major uh, mining uh, country. And when you have large mines located in backward areas or near agricultural communities or small towns, you're bound to have problems. Uh, it's just a natural situation for conflict to occur. So it won't surprise you to hear that Peru's main domestic development challenge is precisely to find a way to contain conflicts between local communities and, their, and the large mining companies that uh, want to develop properties located where they are. Now, some of these conflicts are environmental conflicts having to do with water and pollution and such things. Some of them are distributive, who gets the gains from the mines, and some of them are cultural. Some uh, mining properties uh, tend to encroach on areas where there may be traditional gods or other convictions that there's sacred land, and it just turns out that the ore is located just where those deities uh, always have inhabited. So there's an issue as to how you get the deities to move from where they've traditionally been to where they might be in the future so that you can get at the ore. Now the difficulty is that once unleashed, these conflicts tend to spread like wildfire. They contaminate from one part of the country to another. Uh, it's really a, uh, it's an epidemic kind of feature. It does not work by, con by contiguous locations, it leapfrogs. So if you're not careful, if its conflagration starts in one part of the country, you suddenly have it everywhere else. So you won't be surprised to hear that various parts of the Peruvian government are concerned with containing this phenomenon and trying to generate consensus, generate win-win solutions so that the country's development can proceed without being stopped by these conflicts. Now, we've been growing at about 6% a year, and we're still growing at 6% a year, give or take a little bit, so we've been doing reasonably well. But if we're not careful, we're going to uh, run into some roadblocks. Now, the agency that I head uh, is a superintendency of banks, insurance companies, and retirement funds. So I'm the chief financial regulator of Peru. And you'd wonder, what does the financial regulator have to do with human rights and these conflict resolution issues? Well, the fact of the matter is, when you have a conflict and uh, there's uh, economic issues involved, it always winds up on a bank balance sheet. The banks are where things eventually show up. It doesn't take very long until you find a bank balance sheet impacted. Now, very often, it's not the bank that's financed the project. It's the banks that finance the people that are near the project. So there's a lot of collateral damage involved here. Uh, it may be a small savings and loan association. It may be a municipal bank. Uh, in one part of our country where there's been an ongoing conflict around a large mining project, 
The people that have been hurt so far are the truckers, the restaurateurs, the hotels, and the small businessmen. And so well, as regulators, the people that have come to talk to us about this turn out not to be the financiers in New York or the big mining project. It turns out to be the small local banks that are financing the local businessmen. And the local businessmen have come in to tell us that they're not able to repay their loans because their business has gone away. Nobody comes to stay in the hotels anymore because of the conflict. So uh, it's very clear that we have a systemic problem in which the difficulties in the real side of the economy, the social conflicts, show up on bank balance sheets. Now, what banks traditionally do when they see a risk of this sort is they provision for it. They set aside some profits in one year to cover the potential losses in the next year. And that's a way to deal with it in a narrow financial way. You put aside money to cover the loss. But it also means that you're going to realize the loss. You simply say, well, there's nothing I can do about this. This is a problem that comes from out of the left field. All I can do is absorb the loss and make sure that it doesn't undermine the solidity of the banks. And for sure, Peru has regulations of that sort uh, that uh, obligates the banks to set aside provisions for all sorts of risks. And this kind of risk is one of those that they have to provision for. And uh, the inspectors that work for my agency make sure that those provisions occur. However, uh, there's another way to go at this, which does not involve provisioning for the loss. It involves preventing the loss to begin with. If you can prevent the conflict or you can contain it, you won't have the loss. So a much more constructive way to go about this is to try to deal with the problem before it happens or as it happens, rather than simply say, well, let's make sure that it doesn't destroy the financial system. So we as regulators have begun to be involved in seeing how what we, what we can do as financial regulators to prevent social conflict. Well, is the peculiar thing is that people listen to banks and listen to bankers. Everybody needs a banker. Everybody listens to bankers. So when bankers speak, their customers listen. When regulators speak to banks, the banks listen. So we have a very nice dual structure. The banks listen to us. The customers listen to the banks. So we should be able to talk to the customers via the banks. And that's what we've begun to do. So we're telling the, the, our regulated banks, listen, you must talk to your customers to ensure that they have conflict prevention in place. What does that mean? That means they have to have a baseline assessment as to what the probability of conflict is. They need to have um, an evaluation of the risks that they are undergoing, if necessary, from an outside person or outside agency that can do a proper risk assessment. And they need to have in place a mechanism for conflict resolution or for conflict containment, at least. Now, as regulators, we require the banks to have systems in place that require their customers to deal with these issues. How do we get the, how do we uh, enforce this upon the banks? Well, the banks have to comply with some corporate governance issues, in addition to complying with our own direct regulations. So first thing we say to the banks, look, your board of directors is responsible to make sure that you have a policy of this sort on the books and that it's actually operational. Number two, we require the outside and inside auditors of the financial institutions to see whether their corporate governance organs are in fact doing what they're supposed to do, and they need to report that to us. Number three, we enforce some transparency requirements, which means that the corporations have to go public and the banks have to indeed also be public about the, what they're doing. And finally, uh, as our supervisors go around and inspect the banks, we make sure that they're in fact complying. And we have penalties for, not, for lack of compliance. Now, banks don't like penalties, certainly not when, they're, when their supervisors impose them. So we, there's a system here that can be used to actually generate a change of behavior in the positive direction. The, uh, this, this regulation that is planned is now underway. We're designing it. I've seen a draft as I left Lima a few days ago. I had in my hand a draft version, 10 pages long. Probably it'll grow a bit before it's done. We like to have short regulations so that they're easy to understand. Uh, by the time I get back to Lima, we'll probably have a new version. 
Uh, we expect to have this regulation in place and operating in January or February of 2013, so we're very close to, uh, to doing this. And as far as we can tell, this is going to be a pioneering change in the way a government approaches um, this issue of social conflict and how it tries to work with the private sector to deal with this problem. Now, I'm happy to say that uh, Peruvian banks have been very receptive. Uh, a number of them have already had partial systems of this sort in place, typically the larger ones. Uh, on the whole, they've been very uh, positive to having the regulator put a system in place that generates a level playing field across the whole banking system because this makes sure that the terms of competition are, are uniform. And so this is, turns out to be a very nice uh, collaborative effort between the regulator and the financial uh, system and the financial institutions. The smaller banks particularly are happy because this probably means that they're going to have less collateral damage on their balance sheets. As far as the rest of the government is concerned, they suddenly they're finding an unexpected ally in the financial regulator to deal with an issue which normally not thought of as being the purview of financial regulators. So the folks in the Prime Minister's office and the folks in the human rights offices and so on are finding that there is there's re there are reinforcements here from a totally unexpected area. Uh, we are looking forward to this working rather well, and certainly we also expect to have uh, feedback from our colleagues in, of, in other uh, jurisdictions who also regulate banks, and we'll see how this goes to the future. So we hope to be able to come back in some later date and report back to you all how this effort to use financial regulation to deal with what's essentially a human rights problem uh, will do in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel, for that. Uh, extremely interesting and quite innovative. Um, and now pass to uh, Bente for the next intervention. Thank you very much, Excellencies, dear colleagues. It's, um, it's humbling to be here, to be back. I worked on this mandate for so many years with so many of you here. And I must say, to be here today and be at the opening session and see almost a thousand people participating, uh, it does really augur very well for the future. Uh, let me say that my government is profoundly, profoundly committed to this work. And uh, the uniqueness of the guiding principles was really eloquently addressed in the opening session this morning. Also, I would say that the process leading up to those guiding principles was unique. And why is this so? It was inclusive. It was fact-oriented. It was persistent. And through all those elements, it was also credible. Uh, many have voiced their thanks to Professor Ruggie, his commitment, his strong team. I would like to echo that. But I also want to pay tribute to the High Commissioner and her office for all the work that they have put in and their profound commitment, as well as to the member states and civil society. And I think this is the way we have to continue to work on this mandate. We have to continue to work together and we have to be able to convince one another through a facts-based, persistent approach. What counts now, and I think we can all agree to that, is implementation, implementation, and implementation. To succeed, we as governments, we need con uh, political commitment and leadership at all levels. And let me underline two things in this uh, regard uh, when it comes to the state duty to protect. First, we must uh, protect, and it uh, includes uh, protecting against all human rights violations by third parties. Secondly, the duty applies to all institutions of the state. And this is not a minor point. It is central to the state duty to protect. Protection and implementation 
must reach all people, regardless of gender, ethnic or religious belonging, or political affiliation. This is not only right, but it is also smart economics that was just touched upon now by the last speaker. All parts of government have a duty to implement the guiding principles within their substantive jurisdiction, whether as a policymaker, owner of business enterprises, regulator, public procurer, investor or purchaser. In light of this, a key challenge for the government is to make sure that business are facing a both comprehensive and coherent incentive structure when investing and managing their business activities both at home and abroad. And we expect them to move with the same ethical basis, both at home and abroad. This requires a coherent government policy. I think that this is something we all face in some way or the other, this challenge. In order to respond to it, Norway has established an interdepartmental group to promote the implementation of the guiding principles. For us, it is essential that the mix of policy and legal me measures sends clear and consistent signals to the business community. And let me here underline and pick up a point that Professor Ruggi mentioned earlier today. Norway is one of the world's, mo Norway has one of the world's most far-reaching extraterritorial jurisdictions, covering such important challenges as corruption, trafficking, contemporary forms of slavery, ICC statutes and ILO conventions. And uh, we believe that, we strongly believe that this mix of measures is, is a very, very important uh, um, message. An example of the Norwegian government's strategy in this field is its policy toward state-owned and partly state-owned companies. A focus on these companies is an effective strategy to set the standard among Norwegian enterprises in general. A recent white paper has defined the government's expectations towards state-owned companies with regards to human rights, labor rights and decent work, transparency and anti-corruption both at home and abroad. The state's owner dialogue with the individual companies is the most important tool in this respect. In this dialogue, the government's expectations with regard to human rights, transparency and anti-corruption, decent work and labor rights, as well as environmental and climate are made clear to business. The government expects state-owned companies to respect human rights in all their activities, including in their relations with suppliers and business partners. Companies in which the state owns shares are also expected to respect and promote decent working conditions which safeguard fundamental labor standards and give workers decent wages. The, the state expects companies to have guidelines, routines and operating procedures to follow up the guiding principles. This is, as we see it, closely ring linked to risk assessments, risk management, and risk mitigation, and is thus good business. Another key element in our strategy is the ethical guidelines to safeguard human rights in the Norwegian government's pension funds investments abroad. 
This fund consists of the government's revenues from the Norwegian petroleum production, and it is one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. According to these guidelines, the fund should not invest in companies that contribute to serious or systematic human rights violation. The Ministry of Finance makes the decision <coughs> on the exclusion of companies from the government's pension funds investment universal, un, universe based on recommendation of the Council. The consensus on the guiding principles has strengthened the awareness and cooperation on human rights among the different stakeholders. For my government, it is important to have close contact with both companies and civil society, and here echoing also the views of, of your uh, government, the British government. For this purpose, we have established a multi-stakeholder network. These network. This network facilitates information between different stakeholders and is an advisory group to the government on issues related to corporate social responsibility. National operationalization of the guiding principles is singled out as one of the key issues for the consideration this year by the network. What have we done to disseminate information about the guiding principles? I will mention a few examples. In September, we organized the regional conference on mining and indigenous people's rights in the Barents region. The guiding principles were the reference for the discussion adapted to the mining sector and in particular for companies with activities in indigenous people's territories. Two weeks ago, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs organized the Oslo Conference on Corporate Social Responsibility. The conference attracted approximately 500 representatives from 50 countries all over the world. The guiding principles give us the direction and the tools we need. We, the states, have to put these tools to good use. It is the results on the ground that matter. There exists a huge deficit on implementation. And when we are to evaluate the effect of the guiding principles, it is the concrete results on the ground and what they mean to people that really counts. I've come across dire examples during my tra travels. Medicines that have been diluted, rendering them inactive and causing unnecessary death. Least developed countries in transition and in strong need of income, but where companies have acquired many years tax waiver. But it is precisely these examples that renders this work so meaningful. It is precisely such examples that make it an imperative to redouble our joint efforts to promote and implement the guiding principles. I thank you. Okay, I thank you very much, uh, obviously not only for your historical role, but clearly your continuing role and uh, championing of the guiding principles. Thanks very much. Now turn to the final speaker before opening it up for interventions. And please just remember that now it would be the last opportunity to put your name down uh, at the speaker's desk. So please, if you want to intervene, uh, do that now because it will be closing very shortly. Claire O'Brien from the International Coordinating Committee of National Human Rights Institutions. Um, I was hoping there was PowerPoint, but I'm not sure if it's up and running. I'll just start and maybe, um, maybe it will uh, materialize. Um, so uh, the uh, experiences I'd like to speak to are those of the International Coordinating Committee of National Human Rights Institutions. Um, 
who and who or what is that and what are national human rights institutions not everybody is familiar um, with them so just to recall that the 1993 uh, Paris principles of the UN United Nations General Assembly call on states to establish national institutions for the promotion and protection of human rights um, with mandates in uh, legal uh, mandates in national law to be independent pluralistic bodies um, to promote and protect human rights uh, amongst other things through uh, investigations monitoring research human rights education reporting to international institutions on the compliance of law and policy and practice within individual states um, with with international instruments uh, to which the, the state is a party the ICC uh, the International Coordinating Committee of National Human Rights Institutions is the Association of Paris principles accredited national human rights institutions of which there um, are about 70 accredited to a status and a hundred um, in total um, what is the relationship of national human rights institutions um, to the guiding principles and human rights and business? Uh, well, the Paris, broad Paris principles mandate, um, we think, puts us, if you like, in the, in the middle of a five-pointed star with um, rights holders, um, of course, central and, and at the top, but also with uh, stakeholders in government, in international bodies and supervisory mechanisms, of course, to which we, we report on state practice business um, and also civil society um, and in implementing that that role in relation to business and human rights um, some actions that the ICC of NHRIs has taken recently collectively um, both at the global level and regional level include um, the conclusion of the Edinburgh Declaration um, of the yes of the ICC from 2010 um, which is a, an important statement by national human rights institutions of the application, uh, as they see it, of, of the Paris Principles mandate to human rights and business, um, the formation of a human rights and business working group um, since 2009 involving national human rights institutions from ac uh, across the four ICC geographical regional networks. Um, as a result of the activities of that working group, um, amongst other things, the UN Human Rights Council Resolution 17.4, endorsing the guiding principles, does reference the role of national human rights institutions um, with, with respect to all three pillars of, of, of the guiding principles, both in monitoring uh, the state and its implementation uh, of the guiding principles, monitoring and working with business, and also, of course, helping to secure remedy for, for human rights abuses related to business activities. Um, the ICC has also been engaged in outreach with, um, for example, the, the OECD in relation to the guide, uh, guidelines for multinational enterprises and recently concluded a memorandum of understanding uh, towards cooperation of national human rights institutions and national contact points in particular under the, the OECD guidelines uh, towards more effective um, implementation of the guidelines at national level, of course, transnationally through the specific instances process. Um, and the ICC, very, I think, very importantly, and, and uh, as was emphasized uh, in the, the, seg the high-level segment earlier on um, by John Ruggie, that the, in, with reference to the need for capacity development, uh, the ICC is, is, of course, looking to the, itself and its own capacity, um, the capacity of member institutions to, to be effective interlocutors for the guiding principles at, at national level by for example, producing training materials and training programs uh, for use specifically by national human rights institutions. Um, the ICC has had four regional workshops um, on business and human rights and on, on the guiding principles um, in Africa, the Asia Pacific, the Americas, and most recently for the European region. And just to give you a flavor of um, what's in the uh, regional action plans of the ICC, um, which you can find on the ICC website. Um, th those action plans set out um, actions for individual national human rights institutions, for example, establishing focal points um, within the institutions, integrating human rights and business into their own strategies, um, focusing also on the conduct of national baseline studies on business and human rights. So assessing systematically with reference to the guiding principles, to what extent um, are they actually being implemented, embodied, realized through national law, policy, and practice within each of our own individual jurisdictions. Um, the action plans also set out um, 
levels uh, actions for, for regional networks of national human rights institutions. And, and just to say, if you can move the slides along, please, um, to the next, yes, thank, no, back. Um, just to say what we see is relevant and material in terms of the scope of the guiding principles and national implementation, very much material to, to guiding principles implementation are both home, uh, home issues within the home jurisdiction, but also, of course, extraterritorial impacts um, of national policies, national legislation, uh, public procurement, austerity measures, especially in the European context, have been relevant and, and not immaterial um, to business human rights issues. The OECD guidelines, export credit agencies, national development policies, national development assistance to third countries, um, national pension funds we've been hearing about in the Norwegian context, um, amongst other things. So from, from the Paris Principles mandate uh, start, as a starting point, we, we see the, the, uh, re the relevance of the guiding principles um, as, as very broad. Um, and those are the sorts of issues that we hope as national institutions we can promote um, the integration of in universal periodic review, for instance, and, and in systematic uh, reporting of, of uh, human rights compliance through the UN treaty system. Um, in the European context, um, of course, an important uh, jumping off point has been the new uh, European Commission communication on uh, corporate social responsibility um, and the invitation to member states of the European Union that extends um, to develop national plans on implementation of the guiding principles. By the end of 2012, and, and as Stavros Lambrinidis uh, mentioned today, the um, strategic framework and action plan on human rights and democracy of the EU also calls on um, the European, in that the European Council calls on member states to conclude national action plans by the end of 2013. So what actually, um, uh, well, uh, what actually are member states doing um, in terms of developing such national action plans? Uh, we heard that two thirds from Stavros Limbrunidis today of EU member states are either developing or have developed national action plans. That came as something of a surprise to me because I thought that the number was, or the proportion was still much lower than that. Um, in the European group, we, we've certainly seen it as our role to promote and encourage member states and where possible assist member states in the development of those national action plans. Um, and we have developed a paper earlier this year which, in which we set out minimum standards as we see it both for the process by which states should develop national plans to implement the guiding principles and the content um, of such plans. So the process should be a human rights based process um, which includes clear ownership within the government for the plan, periodic monitoring and progress reporting against verifiable criteria so that the plan is worth more than the paper it's written on. The process should be participatory um, and include representation of the views of vulnerable rights holders both inside and outside the home state jurisdiction. Um, and of course the process should be transparent and adequately resourced overall. Um, and in terms of minimum content, any national plan by a government to implement the guiding principles should, of course, address the full scope of the guiding principles across all three pillars um, and not just pick out single thematic issues um, and address relevant regional standards. You know, in, the e in the EU context, of course, European law is an important source as well as uh, general international st standards. And just to conclude, as I'm running up against time, um, in the Danish Institute for Human Rights, we are currently developing um, a, a methodology for conducting national baseline studies um, uh, against the guiding principles, taking uh, sub-elements of each guiding principle and trying to identify within national law, within policy, within, in terms of enforcement agencies, um, what, are, what actually is the extent of, of implementation and compliance. And I would say that's a very challenging task in actual fact. We thought it would be hard. We didn't think it would be as hard as it, as it is, given the, the very comprehensive nature of the guiding principle. Of course, there are strengths, but it also makes for national human rights institutions, as well as governments, I think, fair to say, um, a, 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 a very challenging exercise. It takes us out of our, as human rights organizations, out of our comfort zone or our normal operating space into corporate law and taxation and various other issues. So th th certainly it's, it's an exercise which does require resources and commitment and probably you know, a little bit more time than, than we had thought it would. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, another panelist in a continuing role in, in championing the UNGPs. So um, 
Thanks very much to all the panelists, um, disciplined presentations, and now want to open it up to those who have registered on the speakers list. Uh, and again, just encourage uh, those who are intervening to maintain this cooperation. The, the more limited they are to two minutes, then the more interventions we'll have. Uh, and we are going to do it in terms of states, business, and civil society uh, to try and ensure that there is a balanced um, conversation that takes place. The first uh, um, intervener I'd like to call on then is uh, Ms. Sally Dawkins from Australia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Australian Government is delighted to be here participating in this inaugural forum today, and we particularly welcome the significant participation here today, which we think really demonstrates the breadth and depth of the interest in this very important topic. Like many of the countries that we've heard from so far today, and I thank the distinguished panellists for their interventions, the Australian Government is continuing to develop our national policy and our national capacity to implement and promote initiatives on business and human rights. Naturally, this includes a number of international initiatives which Australia is pleased to support, including the guiding principles, uh, the Global Compact and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. And I'm also pleased to advise that Australia has recently decided to join the voluntary principles on security and human rights, which already enjoy wide support from the Australian mining industry, but we consider that there is good scope to work further with small and medium-sized Australian companies in particular, especially as Australian investment in the mining sector around the world continues to grow. As well as supporting these international initiatives, Australia has adopted a number of policies to help promote business and human rights, uh, including industry and country-specific programs in, for example, Myanmar and uh, in Africa, and particularly in the mining sector. In Australia, we've been undertaking our own stock-taking exercise regarding the implementation of the guiding principles. Um, in May 2011, we wrote to 186 Australian businesses, industry associations and NGOs seeking their views on a range of CSR issues, including the then draft guiding principles. And then in October this year, we wrote to 207 businesses and NGOs to seek their views on the implementation of the guiding principles since their adoption. And we found this was a very useful exercise to survey the current levels of understanding and implementation of the guiding principles. And I'd just like to sh highlight some of the helpful suggestions that we received through this process, which were aimed at furthering the implementation of the guiding principles. Firstly, some of our stakeholders suggested that the government could further promote and educate business to raise awareness of companies' obligations, which could include developing national guidelines for businesses on how they are expected to act in relation to human rights, both nationally and internationally. Secondly, it was suggested that we could strengthen whole-of-government policies, for example, by establishing an oversight mechanism, for example, setting out the government's human rights objectives and priorities in measurable commitments. And another suggestion was to establish a multi-stakeholder forum on business and human rights within Australia to encourage national dialogue. The third suggestion that we received was to make, uh, implement a domestic reporting requirement under Australian law for businesses to, in, to report on their progress in complying with the guiding principles. Another, another suggestion was that we could promote discussion of the guiding principles in other eminent international fora, such as within the G20, for example. And finally, it was suggested that we could require contractual undertakings to adhere to the guiding principles within international procurement contracts. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to, to highlight some of these suggestions. It's early days for all of us in implementing the guiding principles, and the Australian Government has warmly welcomed the input that we've received from stakeholders. So we look forward to continuing to work with these stakeholders, both nationally and internationally, as we further our commitment to our state's duty to protect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now could I ask the uh, representative from the oil and gas industry, uh, Mr. Bert Bocchinia? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, panel, for your, uh, for your valuable contributions. Um, I'm uh, Bert Bocchinia. I'm the coordinator for the human rights programs in Shell. But this time today, I'll be speaking for IPCA. I'm the co-chair of the human rights task force in that industry association. 
And um, I'd like to, uh, to explain to you uh, first a little bit of background to the organization, but I'll, I'll end with a question for the representatives of the UK and Norway. The oil and gas industry is one of those industries that has been uh, front and center of the human rights developments and dialogues over the past 15 years. So although the guiding principles were new when they were issued uh, only 18 months ago, um, to the oil and gas industry, many of the issues described there were, were not so very new. Uh, it did, however, uh, require us to recalibrate our approaches. So we did start a three-year human rights program in our industry association. And this week we've published uh, the, the, first of, uh, or the first two of hopefully a series of documents about how oil and gas see the United, guide, the United Nations, sorry, the guiding principles applying to their industry. And um, the, the first document, and I, I only have one copy here, we didn't bring 1,000, um, but all of these are available, obviously, um, shows how, how integrating in existing systems is really an approach that, that suits industry well. It's, it's, um, it, it brings us a lot of the uh, uh, added accountabilities and responsibilities already present. We, however, also learned that there is not one approach for the guiding principles. It's all about not one size fits all. And there is differences between companies, between contexts, between countries, and between industries. That is something we particularly found also in our second brochure, which is about um, uh, community grievance mechanisms. Um, we, we really value the contribution here from the, uh, the representative here from Peru, who mentions that early avoidance of issues is so important. And these company-based mechanisms allow us to deal with local problems, uh, with local solutions. We, we are not looking for states to put these, uh, these guidance into law, rather the opposite. Because it's not one size fits all, we'd like to, uh, and we'd recommend to maintain the flexibility of being, being able to deal with different issues in different contexts. And we feel that that is also something in the guiding principles. Um, I think Professor Ruggi always used the words uh, pra uh, principles pragmatism, uh, and that is really the spirit that we're trying to pull through in our documentation and in our approach. Now, I do also hear a lot about uh, legislation, and, and as industry, we feel there are still a lot of voluntary approaches that are also merit and that are b important building blocks to implementation. Uh, Australia mentioned the voluntary principles for security and human rights, and I, and I think the industry would welcome any country with security issues and oil and gas industry to seriously consider looking at the voluntary principles and adopt those approaches and, and principles. Now, now to my question for the UK and for Norway. Um, uh, if, uh, you know, it seems that legislation is an obvious tool that countries can reach out to, um, uh, but it sounds like you have not taken that approach yet, and I would like to see if there is recommendations that you can make to countries who are starting the road of implementation and playing their role in the implementation in terms of keeping up with the spirits of uh, principled pragmatism and setting up dialogues that actually lead to, uh, to sufficient flexibility and uh, fit for purpose approaches for the guiding principles implementation. Would you have any recommendations, please? Thanks very much. Uh, I am going to try and get as many interventions in as possible. Um, then depending on the time that we have left and it is one fifteen that we're up against, I'll certainly come back and ask Michael Addo from the UN Working Group to respond. May not have time to ask each of the panelists to respond, but um, no doubt the UK and Norway can have a, a bilateral conversation with uh, IPICA uh, if we can't get back to you um, during this session. Now turning to civil society and from Bolivia, uh, Rafael Quispe from CAOI. Hola. Hola. Hello. Thank you very much to all of you who have been contributing to this process. I represent the Andean indigenous people in South America in implementing the guiding principles. I've been following this very closely in several countries, several states, in this instance, Norway have been making every effort to ensure dissemination and implementation of these principles and appealing to states to emphasize or certainly take into account the importance of complying with these principles, implementing them and disseminating them to indigenous peoples. We have 
Convention 169 as Indigenous Peoples, a declaration that gives us the right to consultation and prior free and informed consent. This morning I've been listening in plenary and in the working groups, and there's barely any reference to Indigenous Peoples. You would no doubt understand that in Indigenous Peoples' territory, is where, for the most part, the natural resources are to be found. And you have the road construction enterprises operating there. The dissemination and implementation of these principles is therefore important. And I thank those who've already been working on implementing and disseminating them. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, could we now turn to Qatar and Nur al -Sada? Thank you, Mr. President. Sayyid Rais, I want to begin by thanking the Prime Minister for the opportunity to present this important topic in a way that is relevant to the human rights and the rights of people in the trade. The adoption of the Convention 169 of the Guiding Principles of 2011 will certainly help in implementing the framework, the UN framework, which is uh, remedy, uh, protection, and uh, respect. Uh, and this will also promote uh, best uh, practices. Uh, Qatar uh, attaches importance uh, to the promotion and protection of human rights uh, in uh, businesses in accordance uh, with uh, the Qatari constitution and uh, laws. Uh, the uh, country of Qatar has established a number of uh, institutions uh, dealing and addressing human rights uh, uh, issues in businesses. Uh, we hope uh, to uh, uh, be able uh, to uh, exchange information and experiences regarding best uh, practices. Uh, we also feel that each state has its own conditions and its own national laws, uh, which must be uh, taken into account uh, when it comes to the implementation and dissemination of the guiding principles by as well as uh, the need to take into account uh, that uh, the uh, implementation of these guiding principles will certainly take a great deal of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, <coughs> excuse me, moving on swiftly to Total <coughs> and Philip Jordan. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to come back on a few points. Uh, obviously, uh, Total, we're an oil and gas company, an energy company, and we're part of IPICA, so Bert has made uh, already several points on behalf of IPICA. I'd just like to come back on a couple of other points which were actually made by the uh, panel as well. First of all, obviously, the sectorial approach is very important, and, we, um, and we're playing an active part in that. But quite clearly, we need help from states uh, which is both constructive and practical in order to get our company standards, which are based on international norms. And my, my own role is that I'm in charge of ethics for the company. Part, uh, human rights is part of our ethics policy. And, uh, and we quote in our policy international norms, such as the norms of the ILO. And we really need help from states in order to get these company standards based on our norms, based on international norms uh, implemented in the some 130 countries where we've got our operations. Now, um, the other thing that we, where we need help is in order to maintain a level playing field, which was mentioned this morning. So, uh, you know, we often talk about regulation, of course, or the states often talk about regulation. Uh, where a voluntary approach is, 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 is not um, implemented and regulation is involved, we really need that regulation or reporting requirements then to apply to all the players, including, of course, national oil companies and state-owned enterprises. And we often find that, um, that that is not necessarily the case. So uh, we need help. We think it's useful. It was mentioned this morning by one panelist that it's useful when business talks to business. It's obviously extremely helpful for us when states can talk to states. And um, as far as uh, willingness to, to share uh, best practice is concerned, then we're certainly willing to share our practices. And uh, one of the things we have done as a company is to develop a human rights guide, which is available on our internet site. It was developed as an internal guide, but we're now sharing it widely externally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for one more intervention, if it is very um, short. And I turn to uh, David Kinley from Sydney University Law School. Microphone for the speaker, please. Microphone. 
Microphone, David. Microphone. Sorry. Uh, it is short, and it's to Tom Kennedy to ask him what sort of response he did get from the stakeholder, stakeholder consultation about extraterritorial reach, uh, legislative or policy, within the government, and if you have thought about what sort of reach you might, as a government, be willing to undertake. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, indeed, David. Much uh, appreciate that. Um, I would now like to turn to um, the member we have present here listening to all of this from the UN Working Group, uh, and that's Michael Addo. I should say that we lose the interpreters at 1.15, so I am keen um, to try and bring this to a conclusion, uh, but I would give the last several minutes to uh, Michael. Right. On behalf of the, the Working Group, first of all, I should say thank you to Alan and to the panel for a very enriching contribution to this debate. Um, I should say very quickly, bearing in mind what time constraints we have, that from the work point of view of the working group, we are very aware that um, our mandate sits on three core pillars. And in principle, the pillars are of equal value. But in reality, one of those values, and as far as I understand the duty to protect, carries a lot more weight. In this respect, we expect that states will provide leadership, vision, and direction. And this, of course, echoes the point that was made by the uh, representative from Total, looking for um, help from states and looking for a level playing field. And this makes that contribution from states uh, quite important. At the same time, we also expect a sense of partnership in crafting uh, the guiding principles into the national context, a partnership between states and businesses partnership between states, businesses, and civil society, uh, partnership between states, civil society, business, and affected communities. And this is the context in response to the suggestion of the uh, uh, implications for indigenous peoples who will come in. Now, this, of course, will generate some interesting uh, uh, consequences. The idea that uh, was raised by the distinguished member from Qatar that we ought to take into account the national context in implementing the guiding principles is very true, and I should echo that. However, the working group should, of course, be aware of the risks of incoherent implementation of the guiding principles. Now, we proclaim ourselves, if we may, as the ultimate guardians of the integrity of the guiding principles. And in this respect, we would like that member states, where they feel the need, to lean on the working group uh, for contributions and, and suggestions. Now, apart from these very general remarks, there are some very difficult challenges that we face on the working group, some of which uh, are echoed in the contributions from the panel. Uh, there is not yet a, 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 a swathe of activity on the guiding principles. There are indications within the EU and a number of other countries. We would like to see a lot more countries uh, taking very proactive lead uh, on the implementation of the guiding principles. And the working group stands ready to assist as many states as we can. At this point, I want to re-echo the request from the working group to a number of states to, for invitations to undertake country visits. At the moment, the responses we've had from states has not been particularly warm. And we'd like to think that in that very promotional role, we should really be uh, uh, able to undertake these country visits. I would also like to think that it's uh, part of the strategy of the working group to try as much as possible to reach new audiences, and new audiences in terms of states, new audiences in terms of businesses, and new audiences in terms of civil society. But in that context, we can only reach as many as five people could do. So we're expecting a lot of uh, states to act as leaders and multipliers and catalysts to spread the good practice among states businesses to do similarly and uh, 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 civil society to do similarly. I think in the sense this is the beginning, this is the first forum and we are beginning to uh, see uh, a take up uptake on, on the guiding principles and the experiences that are being shared in, uh, in, uh, on the panel uh, proves that. One thing that I ought to say though is that implementing the guiding principles and I think this was made by uh, Bente, it's not an event, it's a journey. And it's a journey that will continue. In other words, having started doesn't mean you, you, you can ever, uh, ever conclude it, but you have to continue to refine it. And in that respect, I, I should sort of cut my contribution off. Thanks very much, Michael, because I've just been informed that the interpretation service has also been cut, so <laughs> perfect timing. Thanks very much for, for summing up, Michael. And 
Um, can I thank all of you for the constructive way we've, um, we've managed this, and could you please show your appreciation for the panelists in the usual way? Thank you. I've just, just one announcement to make, and that is the next sessions will be starting at 2.15. So if you're going to the next session, 2.15.